Many of you are likely preventing yourself from getting so many more kills, all because of your pre-round positioning. I'd go as far to say that if you're watching this video and you average less than 12 kills, you could easily double your kills by just making this small switch. If you already dropped 30 kills a game, congrats, this video isn't for you, but if you're a player who is really looking to figure out how to get more kills, this might be the answer to your problem. Kills are a necessity in Valorant, as much as we hate to admit it, and just by getting more kills, oftentimes you can make the game much easier to carry. Obviously, if you only have 6 kills in a game, it might be very hard to have a massive impact, but if you're killing 3 players around, you will find that you can very quickly take control of a game. So let's dig into that one mistake that a large majority of you are making and how to fix it. To do this, we'll be taking a look at a coaching session that I did for one of our subscribers over at Skillcapped. The Skillcapped website subscribers enjoy perks such as unlimited access to nearly all of our VOD reviews that we've recorded, incredible courses from some of the best coaches in the game, as well as as direct access to our elite player staff in the Discord, along with posting some incredible new courses such as our Aim God course, which was made by yours truly. If you like our content and want to support the channel while improving at Valorant, I highly encourage that you check it out. Our main goal is to provide you guys with value, and the more people that check out the website, the more my bosses will like me. So if you like our content and you like me, I'd greatly appreciate if you checked it out. Getting into our master tactic for doubling your kills though, take a look at this coaching session. I'm just going to let it roll in the background while I talk over it because the audio got a little bit funky on this one, but what I really want you to notice is how active this player is during the beginning of the round, or rather how not active they are at all at the start of the round. You'll notice even before they really see an enemy, they are in a 1v3, which is probably something that is all too familiar for most of you. Sometimes this will happen. Maybe you're on the other side of the map and they never come to your site. These situations really suck. However, in this player's case, that wasn't really the issue. The issue was that they weren't really doing anything at the start of the round. They didn't really have any plan, and granted that this was their first time playing Astra, this is still a major issue. You'll see this sort of thing very frequently with low elo players, especially players who play roles like Sentinel or Controller. They'll sit in areas like Boathouse on Ascent, Tower on Fracture, maybe Secret on Pearl. None of these positions are horrible, really. They are great spots for specific scenarios, but in this case our viewer stayed in heaven on B and basically did nothing the whole round. If it were just first round jitters, then maybe it's one thing, but you'll notice the next round they do the exact same thing. This is arguably worse the second round, despite them actually having more of an impact, because since they are on an eco, taking any sort of long range gunfight with a classic is going to be a definite no-no. This is very clearly shown when you see our student wide swing a long and double dinka player from 30 meters away, only to end up missing out on a kill and eventually dying after taking a dangerous swing. This player landed their shots in this situation, but they weren't rewarded because they were so far away. So how are we going to double this player's kills? Well, it's actually really simple. And then, no, they go play towards that spawn barrier right there and just listen for info at the start of the round. If you hear them rushing you, then you can back up and maybe go play towards the door towards A. You know what I mean, to your left? That smoke will work. And you don't hear anything? So you can walk up here. Just walk up, that's okay. One more. Go help your Neon if you can. Yeah, run up with her. There's gonna be one aiming at you right here when you swing. You'll notice immediately after this advice, our student picks up two kills and easily helps her team win the round. Many of you may just think, okay, King, so you just noticed a weakness in their play and ask the student to take advantage of it. How is somebody supposed to adapt to this if they aren't able to notice these weaknesses as easily as you? This is actually a completely fair statement. I did in fact tell her to push mid specifically because I looked at the enemies and they were just five manning A or five manning C. However, the advice I gave her actually had less to do with the weakness in the enemies team and more to do with just having her play closer to the spawn barriers. It wasn't some expert anti-stratting that was going on here, I just quite simply wanted our player to play closer to the spawn barriers because quite frankly, they were just doing jack shit at the start of the rounds. They were sitting in spawn, placing some stars that didn't really matter, and then panicking after their teammates died. But by playing closer to the spawn barriers, even as Astra, we immediately found a way to try and put them into the action and they instantly picked up two kills and won their team the round. And then, just one round later, they do it again. Even just picking up one kill and living could be an incredible advantage, and had they been playing in B Heaven, there's no shot that they get any of these skills. They just aren't capable of applying the same amount of pressure there. Naturally though, this strategy has its strengths and its weaknesses. I'm not just telling all players that they need to rush forward as soon as the spawn barriers drop. Of course not, that would be stupid. Sometimes you do want to play back. Sometimes you want to play aggressive. Um, so you probably won't be able to do that every round because you just did that, they might be expecting you. But like, 
You can still hang out here. If you hear them running up, maybe place like a star near you preemptively just in case you need to smoke it. So So they flash that. Ah, eh, screw it. Go walk up again. See if they let you. And I try. Naturally, as with any coaching session, there were times where I told this player to play near the spawn barriers and they ended up getting rolled because of it. Now, granted, I did warn her beforehand that this could be the case. The reason she died here had more to do with her crosshair placement and the approach and less to do with the actual tactic. It's not like their rays used any utility to scale up here. She just kind of walked up. Had she actually precisely cleared each angle and been prepared to fight, she probably actually picks up another kill. But for her to do that, she also needs to understand the risks. When I'm thinking of if I should flank, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the map. Specifically, I'm looking for each enemy's location. In this round, our student hears pressure on A long, and they see a brimstone and sage on the map at C. So I say, hey, screw it, walk up. To me, that's enough info, because that means they probably have a 1v1 here at most. Unfortunately, I realized that, but they clearly did not. If you want to double your kills, though, these are the kind of gunfights that you want. This raise is literally just walking at her alone without using util. This is the golden gunfight for you to take early on in a round. Quite frankly, I don't care what agent you're playing either. It sucks to lose smokes this early in the round, but the reality is, if you just sit and spawn the whole game, you're never going to learn how to carry games. You need to make mistakes like this, and your deaths during these games like this can easily be more important than your kills when it comes to your improvement. For example, let's take a look at another one of our students' deaths, and I want you to tell me what you think they should do differently next time. Man, your Sage makes me so nervous when she does this. I would try to help her if you can. Oh god. Yeah. So maybe my commentary gives it away a little bit here, but still I'm willing to bet that many of you think that our students should have just let Sage die. They clearly just got steamrolled for trying to help Sage, and maybe this is a scenario where our player actually got punished for hugging the spawn barrier. Except when we go back through this clip, we realize that they weren't really hugging the spawn barrier to begin with. The Sage was, but our Astra wasn't. And although the Sage making this play solo is in fact stupid, if our Astra is able to help her, the play actually could definitely be something. And as a general rule of thumb, if you ever see your teammate trying to make a play and you're close enough, you should definitely try to help them in whatever way you can. Because that's what good teammates do. You don't necessarily need to give your life for them, but a small bait in a situation like this can go a really long way. But once again, because our student was playing further back from the spawn barrier, when her teammate went to make a play, they just weren't in position to help them. Had they been close to the barrier at the start of the round and ready to get into the action, they might pick up two, even three kills here. But instead, they sat back and meaning that even if they didn't get run over here after I asked them to adapt, their stage definitely still would have. All of this might be a little bit confusing though, especially for newer players, so I'm going to make it really simple. Here at Skillcapped, we like to simplify the game into super simple rules to follow because it makes it a lot easier to make decisions during your matches. Of course, this does run the risk of missing out on a little bit of nuance. As I mentioned, there are tons of arguments to be made for not playing against the spawn barriers. Maybe you're on the weak side of the map and you should be playing for info. Maybe your team wants to perform a trap setup and it's going to require you to be a bit more patient. Maybe your DoorDash order just got here and you need to AFK and spawn. I'm definitely guilty of that last one. At the end of the day though, I feel this rule is pretty simple to follow, so here you go. If you look up at the map and you see a teammate near the spawn barrier, you too should go with them and try to help them out. And if you don't see any teammates nearby, you should still probably play pretty close to the barriers, but know that your goal is not to stop any pushes. In a 1v5, you will get ran over. Instead, you're just listening for info, and being as close to the barriers is the earliest info that you can get. If you look at the map and you see most of the enemies are elsewhere, you can and probably should flank. So it's really quite simple. Teammates are there, fight. Teammates aren't there, play smart. Oh, and for what it's worth, from adapting their play, this player scored the highest kill game in a while, playing an agent that they've never played before. Considering Astra as an agent isn't incredibly good at fragging either, and our student hardly used their utility, I'd consider this a success, even if the game did happen to be an overtime match. That rule alone should be able to help a lot of players improve and get into the action more. I do find that too many players have this problem of essentially just being AFK the whole round, but if you want to take this a step further, I also feel like this next bit of advice can be very helpful. Oftentimes on maps like Lotus, you'll find that there are no teammates nearby at the start of rounds, meaning that you don't really get to play aggressive as often as you'd like. If you're following the rule that we gave you and you don't have a teammate nearby, you should play smart and listen for info. But on maps where there are four, sometimes five entrances, oftentimes you just won't have a player nearby nearby almost ever. However, there are solutions for this. 
say for example they start out the round like this and you're kind of mm -hmm. pigeonholed into playing b but this isn't like mm -hmm. a super strong setup for you like you mm -hmm. don't really want to anchor the whole site alone so instead mm -hmm. what i would like to do is i would just like to play with a teammate personally and i'm like okay mm -hmm. cool i guess we're just gonna leave b open and i'm gonna come over here with our sage and at the start of the round we can fight this if we want and then if we don't see anything at the very start of the round, now we need, just need to start worrying about B. B because um, if you think about Rotate it... over. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the timing isn't exactly there. Like, just because B-site is open right now doesn't mean that we can't get there before it's a problem. So mm -hmm. we can peek this, and we can see if there's a fight going on. And if there's nothing going on over here, it's boring. And we're like, okay, well, this is a snooze fest. I'm going to leave. And now you can just leave, and it's like, okay, well, there's, nothing, there's no harm. As long as you're aware that this is something that you need to tend to within like the first mm -hmm. 20 seconds of the round, you're fine mm -hmm. to leave it. Um, mm -hmm. The problem is just when you don't realize that it's open. In the example I gave to this student, you'll notice I showcase how by understanding the timings in a round, you can find openings to sacrifice map control temporarily in order to create pressure somewhere without really losing anything. If the enemies only see two of you fighting on C site, they can't exactly book it through B right away without any info. Now, if they spot 2C and 3A, yeah, maybe they can run it straight through B, but oftentimes that's just not how the round is going to work. And as long as your team is aware that a location is open and there is a possibility of a lurk, you should be able to adapt that sort of positioning and use it to get a massive advantage in your games. As I mentioned earlier, you will not be able to hold down a push 1v5, so spreading out your resources is generally a pretty bad thing to do. There's a reason that high rank players talk so much about trading and playing with your teammates. It's because Valorant really isn't a solo game. You need to isolate your gunfights because if you fight any more than one person at a time, you will die. And although you can make some really great things happen with just one or two teammates, if your team is entirely spread out all of the time, it's going to be very hard to deal with a team that pushes together. Luckily, I have a great clip that showcases exactly how this sort of thing takes place in a real match from one of my games on Lotus the other day with Teats. This is a round high High Ascendant, Low Immortal rank. So of course our teammates are slightly more competent than what you'll see in Silver, but still I mean, you'd be surprised. You'll notice at the start of the round we have 2C, 2B, and 1A. Quickly after the round starts though, our Reyna gets to pick on A, and Teats leaves me as well as the B player starts to shift towards A. This is pretty natural, as since they're showing pressure A, this allows us to send reinforcements while still keeping everything covered. Since we see pressure A and we don't see pressure C, we don't exactly need two players at C right now, so Teats leaves. As of right now, everything looks really normal. Around 20 seconds into the round though, you'll notice Phoenix leaves to go help Reyna officially, and Teats starts to get nervous and comes back to help me. The reason for this is because having one player anchor B and one player anchor C is a relatively weak setup. We have numbers right now, and we could just group up and play for trades. And since we already put the effort of getting me into a decent spot, it kind of makes sense for Teats just to come back and play with me, since it does not look like they're committing to A at this point. However, However, since Teats is regrouping with me on C and Phoenix is leaving B, that means that B is wide open for the taking. Many players would panic at the thought of this, but in reality, it's not the worst thing in the world as long as we are aware of this. So naturally, to account for this space that we have left open, you'll notice that 40 seconds into the round, Phoenix starts slowly approaching B while looking for a potential lurk, and I start to pre-aim the angle behind Teats to protect him in case there's a player that lurked through. Admittedly, there are still a few holes in our defense, and Teats was definitely still at risk despite my attempt to watch his back, but the point is that we saw a gap in our defense, and rather than panicking, we just adapted slightly. You'll notice that sure enough, the enemies notice the opening in B, and once again, rather than panicking, we just start the retake. Due to our ability to hold map control so aggressively with our stacks, when we do end up having to come in for the retake, we come in from three sides all at once and make it nearly impossible for the attackers to hold this post plant, despite even them using a Killjoy ultimate. Something I really want to point out too is that we made these adjustments without a Sentinel. We didn't need a tripwire to tell us that B was at risk. Just by looking at the map, we could see that it was open and reacted appropriately. And on videos like this, we always get the comments that like, our teammates would never be able to do this. You're, you don't understand, there's no team play in silver. And like, we do understand that. The thing is that you just have to adapt slightly differently. Maybe instead of you stacking directly with your teammate, this turns into you just leaning more towards one of the sites, so that way you can help that player if they need help. From this position, since you're not fully rotating, you're just leaning, then you can watch the walk-in from spawn, and maybe a player's just going to walk right into your crosshair and give you a free kill. There are always ways that you can adapt, and just by blaming your teammates, you're never going to improve. I really encourage you guys as players to try to look for these advantages. As I mentioned, playing with your teammates is overpowered, and if you're really looking
expecting to double your kills, you're not going to be able to do everything alone. At the end of the day, this whole game comes down to how you adapt to your teammates. You can either ignore them and fight an uphill battle doing everything on your own, or you can pay attention to what they're doing and try to figure out how you can use their actions to your advantage. As we mentioned though, these are the exact types of games that we break down over at the Skillcapped website in full for you guys to learn from. I really hope that I went the extra mile or taught you something that you didn't already know in this video. Like I mentioned earlier, my main goal is just to provide you guys value. So if you feel like I've done a good job of that, feel free to let me know in the comments below. Our website is jam-packed of full VOD reviews just like this one and coaching sessions from players just like you. The reason we're able to find these ways of simplifying topics actually is because believe it or not, most players have the same exact issues and just by seeing how we solve them for one player might make it incredibly easy for you to solve it for yourself. I also encourage that you check out our Ask a Pro channel where you can get direct line of contact with one of our coaches and get incredible feedback on the issues that you've been struggling with. As always though, my name is King and we here at Skillcap want to thank you all for watching. We'll catch you in the next one.